Here is a story of the grand old time, a tale of virtues, tender yet sublime. Inscribed on sacred page to give us faith in woman's constancy in life and death. Here in God's book, the bright narration see, and five brave hearts make up history. Ada, great Jephthah's daughter, soul of truth. Ruth, flower of Moab, humble, pious Ruth. Esther, the crowned and worthiest of a crown. Martha, his friend, whom saints and angels own. Electa, strong the martyr's cross to bear. These are the heroines of the Eastern Star. Fairest among ten thousand deathless names, how altogether lovely do they glow. Time's annals yield no brighter, nobler themes, no purer hearts the ranks of heaven know. Hear then, O sisters, sister virtues trace, and light from these your lamps of truth and grace. I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. Nauvoo, Illinois, early 1842, was beginning to look like a real city. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of man-hours for little or no pay, a constant influx of immigrant European Mormons making their way into the burgeoning city. All of these coalesced to exhibit what humans can accomplish when they collectively devote their minds and all their energy to one cause. What used to be a swamp on the Mississippi, now hundreds of homes, dozens of small businesses, a schoolhouse, a community gathering hall, a Masonic lodge, a red brick store, a mansion, a couple of small church buildings, a small armory for the Nauvoo Legion, and half a dozen major buildings at varying degrees of construction covered the landscape. The city didn't crop up out of nowhere, and all the necessary supporting infrastructure worked constantly behind the scenes to ensure a smooth and endless stream of construction could continue unobstructed. Logging operations had cleared every standing tree within miles and were venturing further and further for want of solid lumber. Steam-powered mills were refining raw wood to usable boards. Two brickyards with massive kilns had a constant wagon train of clay coming in to try to fill the backlog of millions of needed bricks. Market areas were springing up on every corner for everything a person would need for planting this year's crops. From an outsider's perspective, a person could travel into Nauvoo, spend a few days seeing the beauty of the city, you know, patronize the local shops and the tavern, and then leave with an incredibly positive experience. Day-to-day life in Nauvoo, for those living there, was not what the public outlook revealed. While the streets may look clean and pleasant, laid out in proper blocks hearkening to the Masonic genesis of the city, the people living in Nauvoo knew that the facade hid a darker side of Nauvoo no outsider could truly understand. Nauvoo was purchased on credit, built on credit, and only functioned due to a constant stream of investors who chose to ignore Joseph Smith's sordid past with his creditors. The city wasn't built organically with, you know, something like first farmers come in and cultivate the area, then a small trading area, and then manufacturing and industry slowly making its way in. The Mormons had brute forced this city into existence against all odds. This flash-in-the-pan way of building Nauvoo left a lot to be desired. Chief of all of these concerns, there weren't any jobs. There was farming to be done, but way too many people and far too little land to employ everybody as a farmer. There were a few menial manufacturing jobs in small textile and mercantile industries, but there weren't any major factories utilizing Nauvoo's prime location on the Mississippi for shipping purposes, as large factories require years and insane amounts of venture capital to get off the ground. Any goods the Mormons were making cost too much and weren't produced at a high enough volume to offset those costs, forcing the asking price to be above local and national competitors for any given good. The only industry with any jobs was construction, but the pay was terrible, sometimes non-existent. Once again, everything was being built on credit, and Nauvoo had no major exports to bring in capital to invest. Nauvoo was a negative feedback loop, and the ledger books were being filled with more and more red ink every single day. Now consider the general structure of society in these hard times. 
The men were understood to be the breadwinners of the home and provide for their family, while the women were there to be homemakers, you know, tending to all of the necessary chores to keep the household running and raise the children with good Christian values. Women rarely held any job beyond what they could do while at home. Dressmaking, rug painting, sewing, basket weaving, making sweets, teaching children to read and write, medicine. The options were extremely limited in comparison to their male counterparts. All these money-making ventures could never interfere with homemaking. That's something to always keep in mind. The women's job, first and foremost, was homemaking. And, you know, we think that doing laundry and dishes sucks today. Imagine doing so without running water and only a washing board for a family of 10 people. With the men devoting so much of their time to church business and construction, women provided relief in the form of home-cooked meals, caring for children, making clothing, and doing all necessary tasks to keep the home running when the men were working for 15 hours a day on the temple or the Nauvoo house or on farming or any other business created by the church. Men provided, women were tasked with spiritual guidance and child-rearing. Women couldn't vote, women couldn't own property or even start a business for that matter, With a few minor exceptions, though, you know, women could take over or inherit a business that was started by a man, but that was just about it. And their boards of directors were almost without exception comprised solely of men. Women couldn't write legally binding wills. They couldn't sign contracts. They couldn't negotiate their wages. If women wanted a voice in politics or business, they influenced it by raising good sons with proper ideals to accomplish their will. A woman's power in the 19th century America was exerted through the men by whom she was surrounded. It wasn't until the 1890s that the dawn of the women's era finally arrived, but it was and still is a long road ahead. To look back even further, 1647 in this country was the first American woman to demand the right to vote. It wasn't until 1869, and that's, you know, 31 years ahead of our current timeline, that the first woman was admitted to the Bar Association. It would be 1916 before the first woman was elected to Congress. It wasn't until 1872 that the first woman ran for President of the United States. That's 16 years shy of a century after the Constitution was ratified that a woman ran for president. Are we supposed to believe that prior to that, there wasn't a single woman capable of being a great president? Are we supposed to believe there still hasn't been a single woman capable of being a great president? What's going on here? One thing we need to keep in consideration is the one of the signature revelations of Mormonism, which distinguishes it apart from its Protestant counterparts, is the word of wisdom. And that's included in the modern day Doctrine and Covenants section 89. We've discussed the Word of Wisdom before on my Book of Mormon podcast and back on episode 28, that's Battle for Zion of this show. There's a story behind how the Word of Wisdom came about, which is merely alluded to in the introduction of the Revelation, which goes as follows. Quote, Revelation given through Joseph Smith the prophet at Kirland, Ohio, February 27th, 1833. As a consequence of the early brethren using tobacco in their meetings, the prophet was led to ponder upon the matter. Consequently, he inquired of the Lord concerning it. This revelation known as the word of wisdom was the result. So that's the section heading for DNC 89. But the story behind this revelation coming to be is actually Emma Hale Smith, Joe's first wife and the elect lady of Mormonism. She was sick of cleaning up the tobacco spit from the brethren and asked Joe to talk to the Lord about it. The word of wisdom banning Mormons from drinking hot drinks and smoking or using any tobacco products um, and only allowing them to eat meat sparingly in times of famine. That's when this came into existence. Spurned by Emma Hale Smith. And this example perfectly exhibits a microcosm of the role women played in Mormonism and in society at large. Their will influenced society based on the social standing of their husbands. The fact that even the modern-day Doctrine and Covenants doesn't acknowledge Emma's influence on the prophet pondering the health effects of tobacco shows just how little power women wielded in the church throughout its history. Given how much progress society has made since 1842, the discrepancy between these power balances is even more glaring today. Emmeline B. Wells is one of the most quotable women in the early Mormon movement, a champion of women's rights and a prominent suffrage as editor of the Relief Society Women's Exponent. 
her wit was particularly sharp, and her pen was her weapon of choice. In the 1981 edition of the John Whitmer Historical Journal, there's an article on the life and times of Emmeline B. Wells written by Carol Cornwall Madsen. I'll be quoting extensively from it when Madsen quotes Wells, and you'll find a link to it in the show notes. It's really a fascinating read. Here's the first quote from Emmeline B. Wells taken from that article. Quote, A man too often saw his wife as simply a necessity in his establishment, to manage his house, to cook his dinner, to attend to his wardrobe, always on hand if she was wanted, and always out of sight when not needed. He doesn't mind kissing her occasionally, when it suits him, but he never thinks she has any thoughts of her own, any ideas which might be developed. She must not even have an opinion, or if she has, she mustn't express it. It is entirely out of place. She is a subject, not a joint partner in the domestic firm. End quote. Here's from later on, quote, Why is it not possible for man and woman to love each other truly and dwell together in harmony, each according to the other, all the freedom of thought, feeling, and expression they would grant to one who was not bound to them by indissoluble ties? End quote. Now, there's a common criticism leveled against feminists that they attempt to denigrate men's position or opinions in lieu of elevating their position above men's. Now, while some of those feminists may exist out there, the broad consensus of feminism seems to be an overall equality of men and women in all aspects of society, which I think Emmeline Wells captured quite well in those previous quotes. And we can discuss what that equality looks like and the the physiological differences between men and women and how those differences may impact the paths that men and women choose to lead. However, that's a separate discussion. Emmeline Wells summarized the position of equalism or feminism extremely well when she said this in the October 1897 edition of The Woman's Exponent, quote, Women are not asking for their rights simply because of place or power or to crowd men out of the ranks of the wage earners or professions, but that they may be acknowledged as being an equal in the work and business of the great world in which we all must live and take part. This great work can never be done well by one half of the human family. It is the opinion of all who think deeply that men and women must do the work together and unitedly, end quote. Another powerful voice in the women's movement in Nauvoo history was truly one of the most unique and peculiar women Joseph would take as a plural wife, Eliza R. Snow. She wrote extensively on the path and plight of women in the mid-19th century America. Hit it, Brian. One of Time's Changes by Eliza R. Snow Some things have changed from what they were when all the fairest of the fair whom fame has ranked among the beauties, were skilled in domestic duties. Our modern misses scarce believe that ladies used to spin and weave, or that gay princes of yore wrought the rich garments princes wore. Since fashion has with folly met, the stars of industry have set, pleasure and profit have disbanded, and labor, like grim want, is branded. Tis strange as foolish, but tis got so, who are not idle, would be thought so, and ladies too have grown so common, no wonder if they plunder mammon. Now who, beneath proud fashion's peal, will dare draw music from the wheel, or regulate the kitchen when Eliza stops to wield the pen? Published in Times and Seasons, March 1st, 1842, by Eliza R. Snow. Various points can be charted throughout American history that could be labeled as the proto-feminist movement. It seems that the complaints the feminist movement attempts to address have existed in some form or another for centuries, and trying to claim feminism started at a specific arbitrary time is an exercise in futility. We can point to the suffrage movement and say that's the earliest iteration of feminism, but you look back a few more decades and we have women gaining the power to vote in territories before the states. A few decades before women could vote in these territories, there were powerful feminist women getting doctorate degrees in professions previously reserved for just men, and influencing local politics with organized marches, even without the ability to vote on those politics. A few decades before that, we have our first female ministers of various religions. Some historians have theorized that the Salem witch trials evolved out of a misplaced sense of trying to quash an early feminist movement. The ideas that women have less opportunities and their general position in society is inferior to that of a man's position, you know, generally speaking, of course, those ideas have been around since the beginning of this country in some form or another, and they existed long before this country was a country. 
the mid-1800s is merely one point on the upward trajectory of women's rights. Joseph Smith listened to his constituents and their concerns as their representative to the Lord on this earth. Joe captured the sentiments of the mid-19th century feminism when he established the Relief Society of the Church on March 17, 1842. This is from the Dan Vogel History of the Church, Volume 4, page 534. Quote, I assisted in commencing the organization of the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo in the Lodge Room. Sister Emma Smith, President, and Sisters Elizabeth Ann Whitney and Sarah M. Cleveland, Counselors. I gave much instruction, read in the New Testament and Book of Doctrine and Covenants, concerning the elect lady, and showed that elect meant to be elected to a certain work, etc., and that the revelation was then fulfilled by Sister Emma's election to the presidency of the society, she having previously been ordained to expound the scriptures. Emma was blessed, and her counselors were ordained by Elder John Taylor." The actual minutes for this first meeting of the Relief Society provide much more insight into the meeting and the reasoning behind organizing it. The meeting minutes in their entirety can be found on josephsmithpapers.org, where they provide a wonderfully informative introduction to provide historical context. So this is the historical introduction. You'll find a link to this as well as the entire minute book of the Relief Society in the show notes. Historical introduction, quote, on 17th March, 1842, Joseph Smith first formally organized Latter-day Saint women into a group with distinct responsibilities and authority. At Joseph Smith's invitation, 20 women assembled in the large room above his dry goods store in Nauvoo, Illinois, to be organized, as one woman recalled his description, quote, under the priesthood, after the pattern of the priesthood, end quote. That was from Sarah M. Kimball's autobiography. Priesthood quorums, units of men assembled according to priesthood office, and usually headed by a president and two counselors, had been organized previously. The women assembled on 17th March elected Joseph Smith's wife, Emma Hale Smith, president, and she elected two counselors. A member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles ordained or set apart the three-member presidency to their new callings or offices. These were the first ecclesiastical positions in the church for women. The name the women selected for their institution, the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo, paralleled that of contemporaneous women's benevolent societies in the United States. Two or three weeks prior to the 17th March meeting, a group of Nauvoo women had met to form a ladies' society to sew shirts for the temple workmen, an effort probably informed by the broader benevolent movement. When Joseph Smith invited these women to be organized as part of the church structure, they abandoned their plans for an independent society with a constitution and bylaws. Joseph Smith told them at the initial meeting, quote, The minutes of your meetings will be precedents for you to act upon your constitution and law. End quote. This record of Relief Society organization and proceedings includes minutes for 17 meetings in 1842, 13 in 1843, and 4 in 1844. By the last recorded meeting in March 1844, a total of 1,331 women had enrolled as members, most of them joining the first year. Joseph Smith attended nine Relief Society meetings in 1842 and addressed six of them. These minutes document his instructions regarding women's new responsibilities, authority, and forthcoming temple blessings. The only record of teachings Joseph Smith directed specifically to women— The minutes detail donations for and visits with the poor, contributions for temple construction, and women's efforts at moral reform and civic activism. Discussions reported in this record refer explicitly or implicitly to tensions mounting in Nauvoo over Joseph Smith's political influence and threatened extradition to Missouri, the defection of prominent church and civic leader John C. Bennett, and the tumult surrounding the introduction of plural marriage. Mm -hmm. That is an interesting detail. The record of the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo ends on 16th March 1844, a decade passed before the Relief Society meetings resumed in the Salt Lake Valley. End quote. That's the historical introduction, so let's go ahead and dive into the actual minutes of the very first meeting. The notebook begins with the cover where it says the following, and this is written by First Secretary Eliza R. Snow. Quote, a book of records containing the proceedings of the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo. The following appropriate fronts piece was found lying on an open Bible in the room appropriated for the society at its first meeting, with this quote, O Lord, help our widows and fatherless children. So mote it be. Amen. With the sword and with the word of truth, defend thou them. So mote it be. Amen. End quote. 
Any of you who know masonry know that so mote it be is directly a Masonic phrase. So just want to add that in there. It continues, this book was politely presented to the society by Elder Willard Richards on the 17th of March, AD 1842. That's who gave it to him, end quote. Now, the actual meeting itself is oddly entertaining. And I hope that you'll share in my delight with this entertainment because, you know, it's kind of hard to to take excitement out of reading meeting minutes, but it's really fascinating to me. And I, I want to share why. Joseph Smith, John Taylor, and Whiteout Willard Richards were in attendance overseeing this meeting and ordaining the various women to their respective offices. The women of this group elected Emma Smith to be president of the society, and then deliberation ensues as to what the society shall be called. Consistent with the historical context that the Joseph Smith Papers provides, the general goal of the society was to provide relief to those who were in need for whatever may ail them. Whether it was need of medicine, need of clothing, a place to stay in a dire situation, this female society was created to relieve them of such stress and pressure. As with the Relief Society today, when the women see a problem in the church worth addressing, they are to report it to the brethren to be handled with the proper authority. However, the original Relief Society exercised a fair amount more autonomy than the modern-day iteration of the Relief Society. The purpose of this society and the naming of such was debated as follows. Quote, President Smith and elders Taylor and Richards returned, and the meeting was addressed by President Smith to illustrate the object of the society, that the Society of Sisters might provoke the brethren to good works in looking to the wants of the poor, searching after objects of charity, and in administering to their wants to assist. By correcting the morals and strengthening the virtues of the female community and save the elders the trouble of rebuking that they might give their time to other duties, etc. in their public teaching. Basically, putting it on the women to keep their husbands in line. (laughs) That's what it sounds like to me anyway. President Smith further remarked that an organization to show them how to go to work would be sufficient. He proposed that the sisters elect a presiding officer to preside over them and let that presiding officer choose two counselors to assist in the duties of her office, that he would ordain them to preside over the society and let them preside just as the presidency preside over the church. Let them preside just as the presidency presides over the church. Isn't that interesting? And if they need his instruction, ask him. He will give it to them from time to time. Let this presidency serve as a constitution. All their decisions be considered law and acted upon as such. If any officers are wanted to carry out the designs of the institution, let them be appointed and set apart as deacons, teachers, etc. are among us. Now that was an interesting little tidbit. This is Joseph Smith setting apart the leadership of the Relief Society to act as a presiding body over the women in the church the way that the brethren preside over the rest of the church, even carving out offices for them equivalent to the offices of teachers, deacons, priests, and elders. The Relief Society wields significantly less power today than the initial intentions when it was first created right here in March of 1842. It's also worth bearing in mind Women in the early church conducted temple ceremonies and anointed and blessed the sick, causing them to be healed. Now, these are duties largely reserved to men in the church today, or in most cases, exclusively reserved to men, which is seemingly a sharp discrepancy from Joseph Smith's view of women's role in the church when this Relief Society was created. The Relief Society was also created as an instructor group to teach women the tenets of the gospel, Mormon women teaching women about Mormonism, from curricula created by women for women. This shouldn't need mentioning, but the Relief Society was truly revolutionary, given the societal norms of 19th century America, especially when it came to leadership in a Christian congregation. It seems almost as if Joseph Smith was creating the Relief Society to be on par with the presidency of the church. The meeting minutes continue as follows. Quote, Moved by President Smith that Mrs. Smith proceed to choose her counselors, that they may be ordained to preside over this society in taking care of the poor, administering to their wants, and attending to the various affairs of this institution. The presidentess-elect then made choice of Mrs. Sarah M. Cleveland and Mrs. Elizabeth Ann Whitney for counselors. 
President Smith read the revelation to Emma from the Book of Doctrine and Covenants and stated that she was ordained at the time the revelation was given to expound the scriptures to all and to teach the female part of the community that not she alone, but others may attain to the same blessings, end quote. That not she alone, but others may attain to the same blessings as were granted to the men, giving women a lot of power and ordaining them to presidencies and leadership roles in the church. It's just fascinating to me to see the version of the Relief Society that's being constructed by Joseph Smith here in March 1842 in comparison to how the church runs their modern-day Relief Society. Now, an interesting part is the men were still acting with authority and needed to set apart and ordain these women to be in their leadership positions. So Elder Taylor, Elder John Taylor, who had become the third president of the church in, uh, of let's just say, of the Brighamite Church in Utah, he ordained the following women as follows, quote, He then laid his hands on the head of Mrs. Smith and blessed her and confirmed upon her all the blessings which have been conferred on her, that she might be a mother in Israel and look to the wants of the needy and be a pattern of virtue and possess all the qualifications necessary for her to stand and preside and dignify her office to teach the females those principles requisite for their future usefulness, end quote. Joe then established the formula for how these Relief Society meetings are to be conducted, with the motions being raised and voted on according to unanimous consent. The way the Relief Society was established to operate is truly indistinguishable from how the presidency of the larger church operated in tabling and dealing with motions and issues. It continues, quote, President Smith proceeded to give counsel, do not injure the character of anyone. If members of this society shall conduct and properly deal with them and keep all your doings within your own bosoms and hold all characters sacred. Deal with everything within the Relief Society. You don't have to come to us, the leadership of the church, for problems. That's essentially what's implied here. It was then proposed that Elder Taylor vacate the chair. That's interesting. Elder Taylor was chairing the uh, the meeting. Now Emma Smith and her two counselors were ordained to leadership. And then it was proposed that Elder Taylor stand up and let the women take the reins. It's beautiful to see this play out. President Emma Smith and her counselors took the chair. And Elder Taylor moved, seconded by President Joseph Smith, that we go into an investigation respecting what this society shall be called, which was carried unanimously. Moved by Councillor Cleveland and seconded by Councillor Whitney that this society should be called the Nauvoo Female Relief Society. So, okay, the councillors say, let's call it the Female Relief Society. Okay. Elder Taylor offered an amendment that it be called the Nauvoo Female Benevolent Society, which would give a more definite and extended idea of the institution that relief be struck out and benevolent inserted. Now, that's interesting. So Elder Taylor, uh, the the women stood up and said, uh, the women took the chair and they said, this society should be called the Nauvoo Female Relief Society. Elder Taylor stood up and said, no, we should call it the Nauvoo Female Benevolent Society. And then President Smith offered instruction on votes, which is, okay, he, the, the table is here. Now let's vote on this. The motion was seconded by Councilors Cleveland and unanimously carried on the amendment by Elder Taylor. So they motioned this vote and then it was taken. The vote was taken and they struck relief out and put in benevolent society. So initially it was called the Nauvoo Female Benevolent Society for a mere fleeting moment because then something remarkable happens. The elect lady, Emma Smith, motioned that she would like to debate Elder John Taylor on the name of the society and whether benevolence or relief is a better word to describe this society. The meeting minutes continue as follows. The president then suggested that she would like an argument with Elder Taylor on the words relief and benevolence. President Joseph Smith moved that the vote for amendment be rescinded, which was carried. So the amendment for changing it to benevolent, Joseph Smith said, hey, wait, let's uh, let's rescind that vote and let's have this debate. Then motion for adjournment by Elder Richards and objected by President Joseph Smith. So <laughs> Joseph Smith said, we're going to rescind the change from relief to benevolence. And then Elder Richards was like, no, I think we should just keep it benevolent society. Let's adjourn the meeting and call it a day. And Joseph Smith said, no, you're going to listen to my wife. 
President Joseph Smith stated as follows. Benevolence is a popular term, and the term relief is not known among popular societies. Relief is more extended in its signification than benevolent and might extend to the liberation of the culprit, and might be wrongly construed by our enemies to say that the society wants to relieve criminals from punishment, etc., to relieve a murderer, which would not be a benevolent act. So... This is an interesting argument, Joseph Smith said. If we call it the Relief Society, people are going to say we're trying to relieve people from punishment. So let's let's keep it benevolent society. But then Emma Smith stands up and she voices her opinion. President Emma Smith said the popularity of the word benevolent is one great objection. No person can think of the word as associated with public institutions without thinking of the Washingtonian Benevolent Society, which is one of the most corrupt institutions of the day. Do not wish to have it called after other societies in the world. (laughs) So Emma Smith said, there are other benevolent societies out there which are so disturbingly corrupt, we don't want our name associated with them. That's a strong argument. President Joseph Smith arose to state that he had no objection to the word relief. (laughs) You got it, honey. Okay, I'm sorry. That one question they ought to deliberate candidly and investigate all subjects. I find this fascinating. Emma Smith asserting dominance in this relief society. She's the president of the society. This is her society to assert dominance. Good. This is how it's supposed to be. Counselor Cleveland arose to remark concerning the question before the House that we should not regard the idle speech of our enemies. We design to act in the name of the Lord, to relieve the wants of the distressed and do all the good we can. And then Eliza R. Snow takes the stand. Eliza R. Snow arose and said that she felt to concur with the president, President Emma Smith, with regard to the word benevolent, that many societies with which it had been associated were corrupt that the popular institutions of the day should not be our guide, that as daughters of Zion, we should set an example for all the world rather than confine ourselves to the course which had been heretofore pursued. One objection to the word relief is that the idea associated with it is that of some great calamity that we intend appropriating on some extraordinary occasions instead of meeting the common occurrences. Ah, Eliza Snow knocking this out of the park, saying, yeah, benevolent societies, they're way too corrupt. We don't want that. And other associations with the word relief, we're just going to make that term what we want it to be. Oh, that's so awesome. Then President Emma Smith chimes in. President Emma Smith remarked, we are going to do something extraordinary. When a boat is stuck on the rapids with a multitude of Mormons on board, we shall consider that a loud call for relief. We expect extraordinary occasions and pressing calls, end quote. Then what must have seemed like an optimistic view of what the future of the Relief Society held, and another extraordinary occurrence ensued, quote, Elder Taylor arose and said, I shall have to concede the point. Your arguments are so potent. I cannot stand before them. I shall give way. Elder Taylor, listen to their arguments. President Joseph Smith said, I also have to concede the point. All I shall have to give to the poor, I shall give to this society. Boom. Elder John Taylor, man to be the third prophet of the church, and President Joseph Smith, the current prophet of the church, said, you're right. We'll call it the Relief Society. I concede the point. That's just amazing. Counselor Whitney moved that this society be called the Nauvoo Female Relief Society, seconded by Counselor Cleveland. Eliza R. Snow offered an amendment by way of transposition of words. Instead of the Nauvoo Female Relief Society, it shall be called the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo. Seconded by President Joseph Smith and carried. The previous question was then put, shall this society be called the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo? And it was carried unanimously. President Joseph Smith, I now declare this society organized with president and counselors, etc., according to parliamentary usages, and all who shall hereafter be admitted into this society must be free from censure and received by vote. President Joseph Smith offered $5 in gold piece to commence the funds of the institution, end quote. Something else remarkable happened once the name of the society was voted and unanimously accepted as the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo. President-elect Emma Smith motioned to dismiss the men and carry on the appointments as the women saw fit. Quote, 
President Emma Smith requested that the gentlemen withdraw before they proceed to the choice of secretary and treasurer, as was moved by President Joseph Smith and seconded by Willard Richards as secretary. The gentlemen withdrew when it was motioned and seconded and unanimously passed that Eliza R. Snow be appointed secretary and Phoebe M. Wheeler assistant secretary. Motion seconded and carried unanimously that Elvira A. Coles be appointed treasurer. President Emma Smith then arose and proceeded to make appropriate remarks on the object of the society, its duties to others, also its relative duties to each other, viz. to seek out and relieve the distressed, that each member should be ambitious to do good, that the members should deal frankly with each other, to watch over the morals and be very careful of the character and reputation of the members of the institution, etc. P.A. Hawks raised question. What shall we reply to interrogations relative to the object of this society? That's a, that's a good question, right? What, when people say, what is the Relief Society? What do we say? President Emma Smith replied, for charitable purposes. Emma Smith said that Mrs. Merrick is a widow, is industrious, performs her work well, therefore recommended her to patronage of such as wish to hire needlework. Those who hire widows must be prompt to pay, and inasmuch as some have defrauded the laboring widows of her wages, we must be upright and deal justly. That is just fascinating, isn't it? Right off of the bat, very first thing they deal with is, there is a woman that is a widow here, and her work is amazing. Let's try and get her, let's try and hire her, and she's been you know, defrauded out of wages before. Let's support her and help her out. That's it. For charitable purposes, that is the foundation of the Relief Society. The very first thing that they deal with after they elect all of their constituent members of the hierarchy and decide on the name of the society, right off the bat, they're already helping out a widow. Powerful. And then I cut out a little chunk here because they invited the men back in. And then finally, the closing uh, piece was given by Elder John Taylor. Elder Taylor then arose and addressed the society by saying that he is much gratified in seeing a meeting of this kind in Nauvoo. His heart rejoices when he sees the most distinguished character stepping forth in such a cause, which is calculated to bring into exercise every virtue and give scope to the benevolent feelings of the female heart. He rejoices to see this institution organized according to the law of heaven, according to a revelation previously given to Mrs. Emma Smith, appointing her to this important calling, and to see all things moving forward in such a glorious manner. His prayer is that the blessings of God and the peace of heaven may rest upon this institution henceforth. The meeting then arose and was dismissed by prayer by Elder Taylor. End quote. That is the foundation of the Relief Society. In the March 30th, 1842 meeting, so this is half a month after the initial meeting that established it, Joseph articulated what he envisioned for the Relief Society in the church as it continued to progress, grow, and evolve. When he said, quote, said, all the difficulties which might and would across our way must be surmounted. Though the soul be tried, the heart faint and hands hang down, must not retrace our steps. That there must be decision of character aside from sympathy. That when instructed, we must obey that voice, observe the constitution that the blessings of heaven may rest down upon us. All must act in concert or nothing can be done. That the society should move according to the ancient priesthood. Hence, there should be a select society separate from all the evils of the world, choice, virtuous, and holy. Said he was going to make this society a kingdom of priests as in Enoch's day, as in Paul's day. That is the privilege of each member to live long and enjoy health. End quote. Make of this society a kingdom of priests. In reference to the Relief Society. He didn't say priestesses, but it's what he meant. A society of priests. The Relief Society had a lot of powerful real-world impacts in helping the poor and needy, and it evolved out of women working together in groups to make clothing for the men that were spending so many hours working on the temple. It was created solely to help the community, and it seems from many of Joseph's lectures concerning the society that he had the idea that the Relief Society would essentially be an equal arm of leadership in the church of women, to give them voice, to allow them to make authoritative decisions, to provide group support for those in need, you know, relief, and most importantly, to bless and heal the sick, as so many women were incredibly proficient in doing at that time. 
Joe articulated as much a month later in this meeting when the release citing Medigan and he provided a lecture. This is from the April 28th, 1842 Relief Society meeting in Joseph Smith Journal in the hand of William Clayton. Quote, Thursday 28th, at two o'clock afternoon, met the members of the Female Relief Society, and after presiding at the admission of many new members, gave a lecture on the priesthood, showing how the sisters would come in possession of the privileges and blessings and gifts of the priesthood. How the sisters would come in possession of the privileges, blessings, and gifts of the priesthood, and that the signs should follow them, such as healing the sick, casting out devils, etc., etc., and that they might attain unto these blessings by a virtuous life and conversation and diligence in keeping all the commandments, end quote. The first woman's organization in the Mormon religion had finally been created. And it would continue on to have another 19 meetings in 1842, about a dozen in 43, and only four in the year of 1844. The dissolution of the Relief Society coincides with the formation of the Council of 50 just a few months prior to the assassination of Joseph and Hiram Smith. It was another two decades before the Brighamite Church resurrected the Relief Society in Utah. But it's worth pointing out, Joseph Smith said, gave a lecture in Relief Society showing how the sisters would come into possession of the gifts of the priesthood. That seems like it was always Joseph Smith's intention with the Relief Society. Bloody Brigham Young, he sought the help of Eliza R. Snow because she was a secretary for the entire time that the Relief Society was operating in Nauvoo. And of course, Emma Smith wasn't with the Mormons out in Utah. So Eliza Snow did follow the Mormons out to Utah or she was with one of the first contingencies to get out to Utah. And she was the closest person associated with the Relief Society who was in Utah. So Bloody Brigham Young sought her help to bring to life again the Relief Society in Utah, and that happened in 1868. Eliza R. Snow was summarily elected president of the General Relief Society. When a question was asked to Eliza about the purpose of the Relief Society, she wrote the following, quote, I would reply, to do good, to bring into requisition every capacity we possess for doing good, not only in relieving the poor, but in saving souls, end quote. The Utah Relief Society in the 19th century was powerful. It sent women to medical school. It trained nurses. It opened the Deseret Hospital, operated cooperative stores, promoted silk manufacturers, saved and stored wheat and built granaries. And it essentially created its own publication arm, the Women's Exponent. Now, and of course, the Women's Exponent was loosely affiliated with the society, but it was staffed with women who are almost exclusively members of the Relief Society. And when comparing the Utah Relief Society to that of Nauvoo, it seems clear that one evolved out of the other and that the duties for the Utah Society greatly expanded upon those of the Nauvoo Society. But we can't lose sight of the discrepancy in authority, in authoritative power of these different societies. The Utah Relief Society was created as a part of the the religion underneath the umbrella of the presidency of the church. However, The Nauvoo Female Relief Society was fundamentally different in that it was essentially lifted to a similar height as the church hierarchy, and the women were given the gifts and the powers of the priesthood. And if you look at the paths and the stories of the women who crossed the plains and who were building the society in Utah before the Relief Society was formally resurrected, they were conducting and using what we consider to be the male priesthood powers with the same authority that they were given by Joseph Smith. There's a difference between the societies, but one was clearly evolved from the other. So let's, let's take a step back here. Let's try and pull all of these floating threads together. 1842 was a ludicrously chaotic year for Mormonism and all those involved. As cited last week, D. Michael Quinn asserts that 1842-44 to was the most active time for the Mormon church, theologically speaking. 1842 Nauvoo Mormonism was bringing in such a broad diversity of people from all walks of life. Prior to the Europe mission trip by the Quorum of Apostles, Mormonism was purely an American religion. 
But suddenly, once the apostles came back and they set up the immigration fund, thousands of converts flooded their way into the kingdom on the Mississippi, bringing all sorts of diversity and schools of philosophy and religion along with them. And Europe has consistently remained a few decades ahead of America in most fields of progressivism. Now, that's painting with a really broad brush, but I believe it's true for the most part. Slavery, women's rights, and a number of other major social issues seem to have taken a foothold in Europe a few decades before becoming public on this side of the pond. This major influx of progressive European immigrants altered Mormonism from that time forward. Most of the brazenly distinguishing characteristics of Mormon doctrine and practice come from this brief period of a major influx of new ideas and philosophies, ideas like a law of adoption into one cohesive eternal family, which may have been patterned after Masonic ideas that were coming across the pond, a plurality of gods, the details of the plan of salvation, the exaltation, Kolob and the book of Abraham, the articles of faith, temple ceremonies, baptisms for the dead, doctrinal polygamy, a number of other peculiar pieces we'll eventually get into, which composed the puzzle of Nauvoo Mormonism, all came after this massive influx of European immigrants. Mormonism was much more fluid back then. And I have this model of Joseph Smith in my mind that he could be approached by somebody with unique thoughts or a school of philosophy of which he wasn't familiar with prior to their meeting, and then magically he would issue a new decree from the pulpit that God or God spoke with him and revealed a new piece of the Mormon doctrine puzzle. Joseph's fluid and adaptive Mormonism is nothing like the Brighamite church today. For Mormon doctrine to change in the 1840s, a person would have to just wait until the next Sunday when Joe would deliver his next treatise on deeper Mormon doctrine. Deliberation on these doctrinal adaptations was also tolerated at the same time that people were being excommunicated frequently for setting themselves up as prophets. Today, however, in order to change something within Mormonism, a groundswell movement with thousands of supporters voicing their concerns with their bishops and state presidents and sending letters to general authorities and demonstrating publicly doesn't seem to be enough force to change Mormon doctrine. Threats to the corporation by the government seems to be an effective way, but those always seem to be the last resort after years of public demonstrations from within the organization. And look, if you run a major organization, it can be hard to take criticism. You're used to the way things operate, and listening to criticism and making changes because of it exhibits vulnerability in many ways. Whether that's vulnerability to admitting that the system has flaws or vulnerability to bending to the will of the public who may or may not have the organization's best interests in mind, it's vulnerability, and it can be hard to deal with criticism. The larger and older any organization gets, arguably the harder it becomes to change things from the way that they currently are. Now, to complicate these issues even further, when that massive 185-year-old organization claims to be speaking for God, any criticism is that of the adversary, and it requires being dealt with appropriately. Our next guest went through an interesting set of circumstances in an attempt to change church doctrine. She organized multiple protests trying to get into priesthood sessions of general conference. She sent conversation packets to the apostles claiming historical precedent for giving the priesthood to women, and it all ended up with her being dealt with appropriately. Excommunication in absentia. Please bear with me for a moment while I give her a proper introduction. She has quite the rap sheet. Kate Kelly is a zealous advocate and passionate activist. She has a JD from American University Washington College of Law, the only law school in the world founded by and for women. She graduated cum laude in 2012 and received the class of 2012 Peter M. Kichino Award for Outstanding Advocacy in the Public Interest. 
In her legal career, she's had various incredible opportunities, including working as an Ella Baker Fellow at the Center for Constitutional Rights, a law clerk at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, a research assistant to the chair of the United Nations Committee Against Torture in Geneva, Switzerland, a postgrad fellow at the Women's Refugee Commission, an attorney at the RFK Center for Justice and Human Rights, a legal advisor for legal action worldwide working on sexual violence legislation in Somalia, and litigation before the African Commission on Human People's Rights, consultant for the United United Nations High Commission on Refugee Reports, Women on the Run, and Strategic Advocacy and Policy Council at the Planned Parenthood Association of Utah. And she is a vocal women's rights champion in the U.S. and around the world and is currently the Human Rights in the U.S. Fellow Legal at Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute. (sighs) Kate, wow. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I want to ask you a couple of questions here, but first, let's give you a proper introduction. For somebody who may have never heard your name or is completely unfamiliar with your work, and in case the name of the movement itself isn't self-explanatory enough, tell us about Ordained Women and what it seeks to accomplish. Yeah, it is pretty straightforward. We chose a straightforward name for that reason, uh, so that it would be immediately evident what the goal was. But, and I thank you for including my introduction. I think most people, particularly Mormons, don't even know that I'm a lawyer or that I have a career totally outside of Mormonism. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, we started Ordain Women pr- partly because the work I was doing all around the world um, made me pause and think, okay, I'm working with women in Western Sahara and Zimbabwe and the Dominican Republic and all these other places but what is it I'm doing for my most intimate community? What is it I'm doing to improve my status and the status of women like me in Mormonism? So I decided to start a group to advocate for Mormon women to get the priesthood. In Mormonism, only men get the priesthood and all men get the priesthood. So any active Mormon man gets the priesthood. It's not like in Catholicism where you have to go to seminary and you have to be chosen and it's a lifelong career and all these different things. So all men get it, all women don't get it, which is pretty uh, unfair on its face. And this, the priesthood itself is the bar of entry, as you stated, is it's all men get it. It's straight, you have a penis, you get into the priesthood. And that can obviously cause some issues when we're talking about equality in general, because instantly you're barring 50% or more of your population from getting the priesthood. And I wonder if you don't mind, for someone who doesn't know the authority and the power that the priesthood itself wields, what is it that makes it so that the priesthood has this uh, the, the authority that precludes women from having any sort of executive authority in the church? So the priesthood is two things. Essentially, for believing Mormons, it is the power to act in God's name. So it's a godly, magical power to literally heal people and to command the powers of the earth. And then secondarily, it's also the requisite for all levels of leadership and authority in the church. So you cannot... You cannot be an authority. You cannot be a general authority of the church unless you have the priesthood, which in this system means you are a man. So um, it's really intertwined, both the power and authority to act in the name of God and the ability to be a leader or an authority at any level of the church. And this ties into the Relief Society because Mormons always say, you know, they're so proud that it's, the oldest and largest women's organization. Um, But really what it is, is the oldest and largest women's organization run and supervised by men. And I think that is an important distinction to make. And it's often said that there is men's roles and women's roles in the church. Men have the authority to lead and to give priesthood blessings and, and use the authority that is ordained to them by God. 
and that is their role. Whereas for women, it is the spiritual guidance and motherhood of the children that she is raising, largely in case her husband happens to be absent from the home in, you, you know, in doing his church activities, whether, you know, if you grow up in a bishop's family or, you know, somebody that uh, is, has been a member of the bishopric, you know that your father spends a lot of time at the church in various meetings, meeting with members and, and just general ecclesiastical duties for the lay clergy that runs the church at the ward and stake level. So I, I, I do appreciate that you draw the distinction that the equivalency of motherhood in the church is fatherhood, and that's separate and distinct from priesthood. It's not like one side just gets all of the gifts, the other side gets all of the work of raising the children. There needs to be a, a kind of an equality. Do you mind speaking to that a little bit? Well, if you've ever seen Sesame Street, or I guess maybe Sesame <laughs> Street in the 1980s when I was watching it, um, there's a segment where they say one of these things is not like the other and they'll have like three bananas and an orange and you have to say, okay, this thing is not like this other thing and learn to distinguish dissimilar things. So for me, when you compare priesthood to motherhood, those things are very patently dissimilar. But when you compare pre you know, fatherhood to motherhood, those things are more similar. So the comparison is just on its face, again, not equal. And it doesn't make sense. Like, it's just illogical to equate parenthood <laughs> with a thing that gives you institutional authority yeah, of course. in the ranks of the church, because those things are not similar and not analogous. But it's used... And, and women in Mormonism are very pedestalized in order to say, like, motherhood is the most important calling and motherhood is the most important thing you can do. And mothers are these venerated angels of mercy and grace and charity. And this is why they don't, quote unquote, need the priesthood, because they are already their most important calling, mothers. And I want to just... I want to dive into that a little bit more because obviously that that does cause some issues and from from the very from the cradle men and women in the church are kind of pigeonholed into their gender roles as they currently stand within the church it's you have the men who are the breadwinners the women who are the uh the the mothers essentially that is their job and it's kind of taught it doesn't seem to be as much the case anymore but at least it has been the historical precedent that women, you don't necessarily need to get an education. The only reason you need a degree is as a fallback measure in case your husband loses his job or something to that effect. So there's inherently I this, think it's still very prevalent still. Uh, OK, yeah. <laughs> and obviously, I mean, even if it's not taught explicitly, it is it, it's it's kind of buried in there. So. Let's I mean it's the proclamation to the family which they still tout. So Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um and they they frequently still cite it from the pulpit at general conference. So I I mean the, there's kind of this this pigeonholing as I said earlier of the gender roles and I it doesn't seem like it's the right way to approach trying to get us all to be equal with each other. And as you state on the on the ordained women website, you cite the Book of Mormon where it says that all are alike unto Christ. So it's in the the Book of Mormon doctrine itself that God does not distinguish between male and female, uh, slave and free, and so on and so forth. So I wonder if we can kind of speak to that as the the gender the general gender roles within the church. Yeah, I mean, Mormonism is never consistent with its own doctrine, so I think that's <laughs> not a standard that we can really rely on. Yeah. Um, and to be fair, that's said of most religions and religious groups. But I find it entirely inconvenient for Mormons that there are scriptures like that. There are different things. I mean, there is also the concept that there is a heavenly mother. So if there is a male god and a female god, how can that be? What are the implications? Um, it doesn't seem like there would be a God housewife, you know, <laughs> <laughs> if there's a God, she has power and dominion and all of these other things Yes, because that's what a God is. So um, I think Mormons have really like tucked away some of these inconvenient doctrines in order to cover what is 
a very cultural 1950s mentality of what the roles of women should be. And the gender roles are, are very American, are very unique to mm -hmm. upper middle class, yep. are, you know, they really are just really, really, really specific to us, to a time and place. And that time is, you know, 1950s and that place is middle class suburban America. I want to walk through a little bit of the just a Cliff Notes version of what happened with ordained women from when it was created in 2013 up until essentially they it, it seems like the leadership tried to cut the head off of this. And that is, of, of course, I'm alluding to you and your excommunication. I want you to, uh, if you don't mind, walk us through a little bit of how everything kind of went down and how this led to your excommunication and how the movement has kind of developed since then. Yeah, so I'll just give you the Clift Notes version and <laughs> if you want, I can elaborate. But we started the movement in Essentially, it started rolling in January of 2013. Uh, we did two public actions where we went to Temple Square and attempted to attend the priesthood session of the church, which, of course, is all male because only men have the priesthood. Then um, fast forward, we did a bunch of other things that really made the church angry, including but not limited to we did a, a discussion series. So we did like the six discussions but about gender equality in the church, which were amazing. And those packets are still up on the website. We did some photo reenactments, so we would like take pictures of women giving blessings or women baptizing someone or leading a congregation. Those photo illustrations were amazing um, because it gave women a chance to really see, okay, what would this actually look like and visualize, which was very powerful. Um, so uh, come fast forward to spring of 2014, so it had really only been a year. Um, I was moving, I was moving to Kenya with my husband at the time and our former Bishop essentially said, I, you know, I need to meet with you. Um, and he, I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm I literally like got the U-Haul. I'm packing, like I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. Um, and he said, you have to meet with me. I won't, uh, your records are that you can put an administrative hold on records, which I didn't know. Um, so he put an administrative hold on my records. I wasn't allowed to move. He forced me to meet with him. And it was actually the stake president, not the bishop. Wow. Because I knew my bishop and my bishop and I were friends. We were, you know, we were very amicable. Like he's a, you know, nice man as most Mormon leaders are. And, uh, so yeah, they, they initiated the disciplinary process when I had already moved. Um, I went to Utah because my family was there and my mom was having some medical problems. Um, so before I moved to Kenya, I was in Utah and then they conducted a trial in absentia. I submitted a written defense uh, and then with the help of Nadine Hansen, um, who is a Mormon feminist who's written about she wrote an article about women in the priesthood in, I think, 1980, the year that I was born. So she's been writing and thinking about this for a long time. She's also an attorney, so she prepared my defense. Um, we had hundreds of letters sent in from people from all around the world. And, yeah, I was notified. I, we had a vigil. And there were actually vigils in many places. Um, and I was notified the next day uh, after the trial of my excommunication via email. How did this end up playing out in your personal life once they did excommunicate you and once they responded to the demands of the ordained women movement by trying to essentially squash the problem? You know, how did that how did that kind of play out in your life and how did that kind of um, how did that alter the trajectory of the ordained women movement? Well, I think what we had, you know, I used to call it delusional optimism. Because <laughs> um, I really, truly, I mean, a lot of people, you know, especially Orthodox Mormons are like, oh, she, you know, knew this would happen, blah, 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 blah. I did not. I simply did not. Wow. At the vigil the night before, I um, spoke with Janice Allred, who is one of the September 6, who was excommunicated in the early 90s. Yes. And she had a sign. She was the only one that made a poster board. And she made it. And it said, uh, we asked for bread and they gave us stones. We asked to administer the bread and they stoned us. Wow. And 
So Janice was not messing around. No kidding. <laughs> she, uh, I told her, you know, Janice, I understand and I know what you've been through, but I really feel like it's going to be different. I really feel like they have a chance to do the right thing. Maybe they're going to do the right thing this time. And she literally patted me on the head and said, <laughs> that's what I thought too. Oh, wow. And so there was there was this delusional optimism. I mean, a positive word for delusional optimism is faith. Mm. So there was this faith, um, you know, in God and in the institution and all these different things. And I think for me personally and also for the organization generally, what the actions of the church did were, were to destroy that faith. Wow. And so, you know, I was personally involved in what I consider to be a very brutally violent act, which is excommunication. But I think it also, and I know it was devastating for the community as well. I've, I've heard people describe my excommunication as when we were excommunicated because so many people felt it as a collective experience. And that was tough. That was really tough for me because I knew what was so personally painful became so collectively hard and, and sad and, and traumatizing. And so, yeah, it was hard for me. I, I immediately moved to Kenya. So that was nice in some ways because no one cares about or knows about Mormonism there except for a small group of people. Mm -hmm. And even the Mormons that I was associating with in Kenya were like, wait, why would they do that? We don't get it anyways. Wow. Can you teach Sunday school? <laughs> <laughs> it's just really different. Um, and so, yeah, I, for me personally, it was a very, it, it was painful, but it was also an easy exit from Mormonism in some ways. A lot of ex-Mormons have these like, you know, decades long excruciating journeys outside of Mormonism. And for me, it was one day I was Mormon and the next day I wasn't. And everyone in the world knew like my in-laws read about it in the New York Times. Like I didn't have to go through the process of telling people and having all these conversations. It was very, very public. So that was both painful and convenient. And yeah, I think I'm also a very loyal person. I don't know that I would have left Mormonism if I hadn't been excommunicated. And so in that way, I think Mormonism gave me a gift. It was an excommunicated, it was an execution and an exit from an institution that is very harmful and violent and it revealed itself to be what it is. And so for, to me, that was a gift. Um, I later met and talked with Sonia Johnson who was excommunicated for starting Mormons for the ERA in the 1980s. And she said the same thing, which I found very interesting. She said, Mormonism gave me a gift. They gave me a platform they gave me associations with other women. They gave me solidarity. They gave me so many things, un unwittingly and unintentionally. But I think for me, uh, in many ways, my exit from Mormonism was a gift. And one thing that can't be lost here is that they didn't solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> they sure didn't. Um, although if from their perspective, the problem is women speaking up um, <laughs> yeah, and gaining yeah. a lot of traction, then maybe they did solve that problem. Um, mm -hmm. The Ordained Women Movement continues. The current head of it, it her name is Brenda Roberts. She's an amazing attorney from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and there's a board and they are continuing actions and continuing the group. The problem is, of course, that that. I, I think the, one of the problems they face is that core faith. There were so many people that were hopeful. There were so many people that were, that saw or thought that we were in a new era. And I think the church, what the church accomplished with my excommunication was confirming that indeed they are not <laughs> in a new open-minded era. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of tragic to see this because this issue 
It's not something that gets solved. It's not a snake that you cut off the head. It is a hydra. You cut off the head and then it makes itself manifest in so many different and more diverse and uh, more robust ways, too. And and to see all of the blogs and all the web pages that were started after this in response to what was happening, all of the people that were sounding off using their various platforms in order to bring this issue to a conversation the way that it never had been before – I think the church's actions, uh, in much the way that the early church flourished due to persecution, because it created a persecution narrative that they could leverage in order to ca- cause people to be more faithful, it almost seems as if the same thing happened with the church concerning the ordained women as well, because they tried to persecute this movement into nothingness, and now these conversations are happening on a day-to-day basis of what does it mean to be equal within the church and what does it mean to be uh, accepted as a member of the church and not be in conflict with that and what does it mean to when when the church essentially excises 50 percent of the population or more because they don't happen to have a specific set of genitalia then then you're losing all of the ideas and all of the contributions that that 50 percent of the population could be contributing to make the church more accepting and more diverse and more beautiful. And that is a self-defeating proposition. That's not the right way to approach things in my mind, at least. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind um, articulating this for me as well. Do you support ordination of everybody? I mean, er- people who are non-gender binary, gender queer, or whatever the case may be, is it an ordain everybody or just an ordain women? Yeah. And I think, um, well, I think it is so complicated, and that's, I think, the thing that church is afraid of. They don't want to complicate Absolutely. gender. Yeah. They just want yeah. it to be very direct and binary. There are men, they get the priesthood. There are women, they don't. Um, and so I think it's important to understand, like you said, that gender is not genitalia, that there are gender queer people. There are, in fact, trans women who have the priesthood. Mm-hmm. And at least one, I think maybe two profiles on ordained women are of Um, trans women who had the priesthood before they transitioned and are women. And so there are these categories where it's just like, uh, it's not so easy to define. It's not so easy to put in boxes. And I would advocate, of course, that everyone get the priesthood who wants it. Um, Gina Colvin is, I love her ordained women profile because in it, she says unordained most men. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and that there should be requirements and qualifications and that there should be a training, you know, situation because these people have like pastoral care over a lot of vulnerable individuals. And so there should in her estimation be some sort of, um, process by which you get this ordination. And I, I could see the value in that. Um, but as it stands, since all men get the priesthood, I would say it would be extended to all people equally. However, um, it makes a lot of sense to me. For example, if if the the, the person in authority is a, a you know interviewing a woman about sexual abuse, it seems that there should be some sort of training for that, and there isn't yeah. currently. So very unqualified people who could be like a plumber or a contractor or a lawyer or whatever it is in their training are dealing with very sensitive topics with very vulnerable people, and I find that to be troubling. And of course, that's how this wraps up into the Protect LDS Children March as well. You know, right. get these people training. Children among those groups, I would say. Yeah. So I want to, uh, I don't have you for a whole lot more time, and I appreciate you taking so much time to to talk to us about ordained women. I have to um, to speak to something that I think, or ask you about something that I think may hopefully assuage people who may not be I'm just going to say who may not be pleased with your presence on this podcast because you have in the past done some things that people have viewed as very polarizing. And I know that you have dealt with a lot of criticisms in the past that sometimes you may be too firebrand of a feminist or that you may be doing something, appropriating certain terms or phrases that were previously used for um, for non-feminist issues and using those as a, a feminist slogan or a feminist uh, call to action, essentially. How would you answer those criticisms and people who are uh, may have been displeased with your previous actions in, in your past with this ordained women movement? Yeah, I think um, I think activism is just a process, you know, 
and I think movements are are a process. And I think that's one way that I never really fit in in Mormonism, although I was very orthodox and in many ways very typical. I, I never really was like a goal-oriented person. Like I never got my young woman in medallions, which is very, you know, mm. you set all these goals and you do all these micro things and then you blah, blah, blah. And Mormons are very like seven habits of highly effective people. Like you're going to do this, then you're going to do this, yep. then you're going to have your 10-year plan, then you're going to have your 20-year plan and everything is laid out. I'm a very process oriented person and I think I learn as I go. So I'm not going to say I haven't made any mistakes cause that's silly. <laughs> um, and so I have like for sure made tons of mistakes. And I think, you know, at the beginning ordained women was not an intersectional organization and that's really, really important. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the things I say, people just nitpick because they're already, mad at me for one reason or another mm -hmm. um, before they read whatever I write and then they pick out one word because they're like, you see? Ah! Yeah, um, of course. And so, yeah, it's both. I think there are both legitimate criticisms and criticisms from people who have already had their minds made up. I remember I wrote um, a piece in The Guardian and I said Mormonism is survival of the least fit. Uh, and that was, I think that, well, that was right up there with one of the things that made people the most angry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're like, how dare you? Um, and I, it's just funny to me. I'm like, why do you even care what I think? You know, like, why do you even <laughs> care? Like, just if you don't think what I have to say is valuable, move on. Um, that's fair. But I guess that's the that's the point of someone who is an activist is to get conversations going. So I think in those instances, I'm like, okay, well, you know, deal with it. Um, and I think in many ways, it's very true. Uh, one of the people that um, was so upset about the survival of the least fit comment was a federal judge who's Mormon. <laughs> and he like wrote me this whole email about how it's not true and how very talented, amazing people like him still participate in Mormonism. And I was like, well, with all due respect, it's pretty obvious why your participation in Mormonism is still pretty easy. I mean, the entire system was made to venerate and um, really support people like you, white men with in positions of power. So of course it's, still suits you. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, that cannot be said of other people. So yeah, I think it's both. I mean, I think their mistakes have been made. I mean, we, I don't know specifically what you're referencing, but I will definitely own up to times when I, I made mistakes or said stupid things or, you know, phrased things in the wrong way. And, but, the, but it's a process. And I think that's, so that's something that like, just in general, not even outside of Mormonism, that people in prominent or public positions are not allowed to be different. Like I remember one time Emma Watson, who's a actress and uh, advocate with the United Nations, someone dug up something that she said like literally like a decade ago and a decade ago she was a teenager. Mm -hmm. So it was something that she had said in some video when she was a teenager and they dug it up and said, okay, so you are essentially as a condemnation of her actions. And I'm like, that just can't be like, there has to be some room. There has to be a nuanced, like there has to be room for people to change and to change their minds. Um, yeah. and if there isn't, then I don't know what, I don't know. There, there just has to be. And so I would say I would put myself in that category. So Kate, I do want to kind of echo your sentiment and add where I think there is applicable information here because men within the church haven't ever needed advocates in order to get them out from under oppression of some sort. I mean, men in the church have always been in the position of power. They haven't needed an ordained men movement in order to become equal to where women are. That's just not the way that the structure is set up. So when there is a group that is being oppressed by a hierarchy, there does need to be an advocacy and a group at the ground level who is possibly more firebrand to get those conversations started so that the hierarchy and that the people who are part of the system not realizing that um, inherent discrepancies exist in the power structure can begin to have those conversations with each other. And I'll just say that 
while some of your actions, I understand, have been fairly polarizing and you, when you search the name Kate Kelly online, you will find for every one blog post about how great ordained women is, you'll find another aspersion of Kate Kelly's specific action because you have been the forefront, you know, the figurehead of this movement for so long. And you've taken a lot of flack that I think is largely unfounded based on your actions, because I think there's room in this movement for all brands of activists, whether it's the fire brands who are who are, you know, calling out things and and yelling from the pulpit or whether it's people who are working, you know, in much more subtle ways and just having open and honest conversations in public platforms. I think that there needs to be room in this movement for all of us and all of us are working towards trying to create more equality within the church. So I I just wanted to kind of add that in to your statements because I, I feel like this is all I, – I don't want people to be um, dissuaded from listening to this because you are on this because this is a conversation about the ordained women movement and what it means to have priesthood ordination. And there is some historical precedent that women in the early church in the Relief Society may have been ordained or that they they possibly were going to be ordained had Joseph Smith lived a bit longer. And I think this is a conversation worth having. And any conversation that gets us towards more equality among all genders and all gender identities, I think, is a worthwhile conversation. Yeah, I agree. And that's what a movement is. I mean, that's like, you know what I mean? Like with many actors and many people trying to change and there's no one person that's a movement. I mean, if there's a person, it's an individual doing actions on their own. If there are many people who join that person or if there are many people doing many actions, then it becomes a movement and that's what a movement is. And so, yeah, I like what you said. And I think, um, I think it's important to think about it that way and also acknowledge that the contributions of everyone, regardless of what they are or how they act, are important to that change. And so it's not just people out in the front. It's not just spokespeople. It's not just folks who get a lot of attention or um, coverage, but it's a lot of people doing a lot of work behind the scenes. And that's, you know, that can be said of Nadine. Nadine, the person who wrote My Defense, is a good example. She did a lot of behind-the-scenes work to fight against Proposition 8 in California, including connecting the names of individual ward members and stake members on church rosters with people who had donated to highlight the financial contribution of Mormons to the Proposition 8 campaign. Wow. That's okay. not a glorious job, no. but it is really, really important to fighting homophobia and um, homophobia aggression of the church. So there are people who are doing work behind the scenes that's just as important, even more so than anyone who you know of or who you see. And I think all of those contributions together will hopefully make positive change, if not in the church in general, um, and will help people leave and find a healthier community to be a part of. Thank you so much, Kate, for joining us. Is there any final thoughts that you'd like to leave us off with for today? Yeah, I think um, just a reflection on the Relief Society. I think it's really important. You know, I said that the Relief Society is supervised and run by men, which is true, but it started as an organization for women and by women. It had a lot more autonomy in the beginning. And so I think Mormon women can look to that organization and think about why it is that things have changed, why it is that they had you know, their own budgets and their own publications and their own manuals and their own, they had autonomy at the beginning of the Relief Society and that ended. And so why, why has it changed and how can it change for the better in the future? I think are really important questions and to learn about those women and why they did what they did. Um, and, you know, when you get to a point in an organization where women are worse off in the 21st century than they were before. Um, I think that organization is headed on the wrong trajectory. And so think about, you know, why women in 1840 had more participation and were in a more egalitarian organization and how we can change that is really the goal. Fantastic. And I would just also, um, I, 
I think history has an incredible way of informing us on how our society is today and why it is the way it is today. And that is, I, I think, particularly poignant. Uh, very well said. And I want to give you an opportunity to uh, let people know where they can get a hold of you, uh, Twitter, Facebook, everything like that. Yeah, um, I'm on Twitter. I guess I think Twitter is probably my favorite medium, although I'm not as active on it or as good at Twitter. Uh, it's just um, K underscore uh, Kelly underscore ESQ for Esquire, which is a word for lawyer. And same on Instagram. They can find me on Facebook. Um, or my website is kkellyesq.com. Shoot me a message there. So, yeah, very exciting. And I think um, there are so many Mormon women that inspire me for what they're doing against great odds. So when Mormon women achieve things in the world, it's, again, it's against great odds. It's with a lot of obstacles in the way. It's with training that did not prepare us for the you know professional field. It's with a lot of barriers psychologically about our worth and about our place in the world and our place in positions of authority. So I, I really applaud Mormon women who are achieving so many amazing things because they've it's come at a great cost. I know that cost personally, and I know that that's the same thing for other women. So I'm excited to see what the next generation of Mormon feminists bring and do. Kate, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing this platform with me. Thanks for having me. The truth of the matter is, it's really hard to change things in a church led by a group of men who are cognizant of world events during World War II. They grew up and matured in a different world than we inhabit today. These men were on their missions more than half a century ago. They were born before there was a single temple outside the contiguous United States. They don't see anything wrong with the system because they're completely insulated from what's happening on the ground level. And that is unacceptable. There's a glimmer of hope here. The more the church leadership digs in their heels on these important human rights issues, the more people become disenchanted. People won't continue to just ignore issues like Protect LDS Children, McKenna Denson, Ordain Women, and any of these other social movements pushing for change within the church. The longer the leadership ignores these issues, the more people simply walk away. The anecdotal evidence of wards being closed or you know, being consolidated worldwide and the church's own statistics reveal stagnating growth, coupled with tax exemption being revoked in Europe due to the exclusivity of temple attendance. All of these are pressures the church must respond to in some way. The longer they don't respond, the further they dig themselves into this hole. Something bears attention here. When it comes to these various movements, public criticism from within the movements doesn't do any good. Activists can overstep boundaries or make people feel uncomfortable, but lobbying bombs at each other, especially when a private conversation would suffice and be much more effective, only damages the movements and decreases their effectiveness. Infighting doesn't bring diversity. It weakens the foundation of these grassroots movements. The leadership of the church relies on a lack of cohesion for these groups to be less effective, and to see the online criticisms of Kate Kelly and other activists working to change the church is something the leadership relies on to destroy that cohesiveness of any given movement and prevent any changes from actually happening. On a personal note, I've been following these social movements for years now. My opinions of the church and its leadership have vacillated along the spectrum of vitriol and anger to pity for the leadership being victims of the system they're unwittingly perpetuating. Seeing the church stagnating the way it is and watching so many online movements crop up in opposition to the status quo is heartening, to say the least. For every story I read on the ex-Mormon subreddit of a transition story or a resignation sent through quitmormon.org, to every blog post lobbing bombs at the leadership, I'm absolutely giddy about this. And, you know, I know I'm revealing my biases and transparency is important when it comes to these issues. In short, it's really fun to watch this train wreck in slow motion. It's not fun to watch those who are hurt and damaged by it 
And that's an important distinction to make. But the institution itself floundering in uncertainty of what the future holds with absolutely no solutions to keep the monster fed, that's something worth relishing as we watch the Mormon church continue to degrade into antiquity. That will do it for today. Had a little bit of house cleaning really quickly. There were a couple of corrections that I needed to make on the last episode. That was the Masonry and Mormonism episode 100. First off, the ceremony changes. I made a blanket statement about the ceremony changes in 1990. Um, The ceremony has actually changed so many times over the Brighamite history. It wasn't just 1990 when they retired the the washings and anointings and then removed the violent consequences, actions of the blood atonement. There were changes long before that, and there have been changes since. You'll actually find a link in the show notes uh, that Julie sent me over. So thank you for that, Julie. And that documents the evolution of the temple ceremony since its inception in 1842. It's a really informative article. Also, uh, Cheryl pointed out that when I asserted that John C. Reckett Bennett likely used connections that he made in his Masonic days prior to joining Mormonism in order to lobby the Illinois government to pass the Nauvoo Charter, uh, I need to clarify that assertion. That was just speculation. It seems like a reasonable point of speculation. You know, you make lifelong friendships when you're in the government and you may make some of those friendships through the Masonic lodges that you attend. When you stop attending the lodges, those friendships don't just immediately dissolve. So that just needs to be clarified. That is definitely speculation. There was also another email that came in, and this was from a Mason specifically. I'm just going to read his email here. I thought it was really fascinating. Uh, he, he says, I'm a Christian, a Campbellite, actually, which is really interesting. If anyone of you know the history of Sidney Rigdon and his affiliation with Alexander Campbell, that's, um, yeah, he shares a little bit of history with Mormonism. So Campbellite, uh, and he says, and a Freemason, as well as a few other things. I have to tell you about uh, how I'm how much I enjoyed your excursions into both of these areas, particularly the most recent episode about Freemasonry's influence upon Mormonism. For a non-Masonic historian, you could have you could not have done much better in my estimation. Years ago, I fancied myself something of a Masonic historian. I suppose if we were having coffee, I would add some nuance to what you imparted. But generally speaking, the episode was fair, informative and accurate. Well, thank you very much. I learned nothing about Freemasonry, but it answered a question that was never fully answered before. While I was active in Freemasonry, I had the pleasure of befriending a Mormon within the Lodge. We went through the first three degrees at different times, but both went through the Royal Arch degrees together. At one point in the ritual, he turned to me and said, Oh, now I see why the bishop discouraged me from becoming a Mason. (laughs) This raises a lot of questions within me. (laughs) I love this story. He then went on to describe exactly what we were going to experience in the ritual we were participating in. He was correct. I have to say, it kind of lessened the effect it might have had on me, you know, ruining any surprise that might have been coming later. Later, I asked him, how'd you know all of that? Dude, he said, that's our temple ritual. (laughs) Because of that experience, he later told me that he left the LDS church and is now a Protestant Christian. (laughs) That's really, really fascinating to see that uh, masonry dragged this guy out of uh, out of Mormonism. Uh, anyway, he continues, your show really fleshed out, put a lot more meat on those bones for me. I really, really love that episode. I do have one petty, very small correction. In your opening or somewhere near it, you describe masonry as a boys club where ideas are exchanged and there's a lot of drinking. Uh, he said, I'm not I'm not sure you said a lot. Uh, Here's the minor correction. I should add that I know this uh, true only in five grand jurisdictions where I have attended lodge. It could be different elsewhere, but I would be surprised. Drinking is not allowed. Further, if it is apparent that a brother has been drinking, he will be asked to leave, but of course, welcomed to return. In fact, the shrine often refers to as, referred to as the playground of masonry was created in large part to provide a setting in which masons could have a drink together. And then he closes up with, again, thank you for your work. I'm not sure what your motivation for beginning this podcast was, but I have to tell you my confirmation bias going in was that it was going to confirm my then existent general low regard for Mormonism. (laughs) I, like most uh, uh, Orthodox Christians, have been indoctrinated to view Mormonism as heresy. I must say, especially recently, my opinion, at least of mainline LDS, is far more favorable than it was initially. 
So I thought that was just a really nice email from Carl. Uh, so Carl, thank you for sending that in and for sharing a little bit of your story. So I just wanted to also respond to that. Before the lodges and the temples were constructed in any given area, masons largely met in taverns. Now that doesn't immediately follow that they were getting hammer smashed drunk every time, uh, but some of them would drink during meeting and you know get all different levels of inebriated. So uh, much it should also be noted that much of the temperance movement in America was supported by Masonic lodges and Christian organizations that were filled uh, with people who were Masons. So as with everything in most episodes of this show, there's a lot of nuance to the subject matter. And um, yeah, I, I should have qualified what I said a little bit more and not just been so broad and, make, and painting with such broad of a brush. So once again, thank you, Carl. Also wanted to read off another email, and this was actually from Connor. And Connor and I shared a little bit of email correspondence, and this was just something that, um, well, this is just a way that I'm going to express my gratitude to Connor for sending in this email as well as for becoming a patron. So I'm just going to read this and, you know, uh, take it how you will. He says, Hey Bryce. So I don't know if people normally do this, but I thought I'd drop you a message to go over my history with the podcast and why I've decided to become a patron. It's a bit of a long email. So apologies in advance. And I apologize all to all the listeners. If you don't want to listen to this, skip forward a, a couple minutes here. And it came to pass drink that about a year and a half ago, I was trying to find some kind of audio reading of the book of Mormon to help with scripture, scripture study. And just to generally to have scriptures I could listen to when I was out and about, I listened to a few, to a few, but it was mostly older guys reading it all monotone and boring. But then I came across a little podcast called my book of Mormon. I listened to the first couple of episodes and fairly quickly found myself warming to David as a convert, a lot of the jokes he made about the material resonated with me, and I loved the outsider's perspective. Around late May to early June last year, I got to your guest episode on Alma 57. Like David, I warmed to you immediately and started listening to Naked Mormonism. At the time, I was preparing to leave for my mission. He's getting ready for his mission. That's amazing. I got my call a month after I left to Greece, by the way. As part of my preparation, I was looking into anti-Mormon material so I would be able to answer questions investigators might have rather than be blindsided by issues I didn't know existed. I have to say, that's incredibly honest of you, Connor. That's you know, that, that exhibits a level of intellectual integrity that I think a lot of missionaries are not willing to put the effort into. So seriously, good on you. Congratulations. He says, part of those materials was your podcast. <laughs> Somebody preparing for their mission stumbled on my podcast. I'm sorry for you, man. As something of an amateur historian, I was and still am interested in very early church history. And whilst the official church history was fine, the Nemo podcast was so well researched and backed up with historical evidence that I started being unable to ignore some of the conclusions you were coming to. Eventually, around late September, I got around to your mammoth Book of Mormon origin episode, and my shelf, started by David, was finally broken by you. The evidence that the Book of Mormon was a 19th century work and a plagiarized work at that was incontrovertible. I put a post up on Facebook towards the end of October that I was leaving the church, which didn't go down well. I think the terms Satan worshiper and son of Satan were used, but I haven't looked back. It's been a rough few months as I've tried to deprogram myself, but this podcast, as well as the fine work David has done and that you and Marie continue to do, have been a big factor in it. So from the bottom of my heart, a big thank you to all three of you for the support you have unknowingly provided and for helping me to see the church for what it really is, a way for rich men to get richer under the illusion or delusion of religion. Then he goes on uh, just to conclude conclude with, uh, thank you again, Bryce. Keep up the amazing work uh, that you do, and I look forward to the next episode. Kind regards, signed Connor. So I just wanted to read that because I just thought that this story was very, I don't know, it, it's heartwarming. Connor was getting ready for his mission. He had the intellectual integrity to investigate anti-Mormon, quote-unquote, anti-Mormon literature, material that he had been told for his entire time since being a convert is nothing but of the adversary. It's evil literature that, that he should be afraid of it. And he still had the fortitude to investigate and look further into it. And I just, I really think that says uh, volumes about Connor's uh, personality and what he was able to accomplish by listening to these and with his ability to conclude that this is all just... <laughs> 
a fabrication. It's just a fabrication by Joseph Smith, perpetuated by people who are, well, part of the system, who are, uh, let's just say, um, probably not exposed to much information outside that might cause them to question what it is that they are truly doing. So um, that's my way of saying thank you so much for sending in that email, Connor. And thank you so much for signing up to support at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. And if any of you want to share your stories, of course, we haven't done listener stories for quite a while. Uh, you can always send them to nakedmormonism at gmail.com. I try to do, reply to as many emails as I possibly can. So keep sending in that feedback and let me know what you think. And um, you know, some of those emails do slip through the cracks, but I really try to be vigilant in replying to all of those. And also be sure to give us a follow on Facebook and Twitter and any place that you can really leave a review for the show that really helps us spread the word. So thanks to everybody who does those things. You guys are awesome. Also wanted to give everybody a heads up. There is, uh, we're doing our Nemo home evening that is coming up on Monday, the first Monday of the month. That is going to be Monday, May 7th. We're starting at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We're going to have on the hosts of the We Talk About Dead People podcast. It's a really fantastic history podcast. I went on there and talked about Sidney Rigdon a couple of months ago. That was a really funny episode. You can check the show notes. You'll find a epi- uh, link to that episode, and uh, it's going to be a really good time. We're hoping to have both of the hosts of it. Um, it we definitely have one of them nailed down. The other one might not be able to make it, but we're definitely uh, looking forward to having them on to just talk some American history and... Um, some broader history as well. They don't just talk about dead Americans. So looking forward to that. If you are a patron of the show, be sure to check your Patreon inbox. The in, uh, the uh, account that you have, the email account you have signed up with Patreon, you'll get a link to join us in that that hangout. Also, I wanted to let everybody know there is a Sunstone in Short Creek coming up this next weekend. They are doing a service project through the fernfoundation.org. And this service project is trying to help convert the old Warren Jeff's house into a rehabilitation and an education center, essentially. So I actually met with some of the people when I was down there during uh, the holiday season, and they have a lot of work ahead of them. They could really use some help. So if you feel like you want to help support a community that is in dire need of getting off of the ground from all of the damage that was caused by the Jeff's family, you can uh, check that out at the fernfoundation.org forward slash donate. They're looking for all kinds of construction and building supplies. And if, uh, if you can donate supplies, that's fantastic. If not, they do have just a general fund to donate in order to help convert this center. It's, it's really, um, a step forward to help this community continue to heal from all the damage that was caused. So thank you to the people that do support that. And also for anyone who is going to Sunstone in short Creek, I really wanted to make it out, but I am, um, I am, <laughs> let's just say saving up for a trip out to Missouri this coming September for the John Whitmer historical conference. And maybe that might be something you want to mark on your calendars coming up in mid September. You can go to John Whitmer historical associations website and find out more information there. With all that said, today has been May 3rd, 2018. Thank you so much for joining me. And I hope to talk at you next time here on the naked Mormonism podcast. This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager, Natalie Newell as production assistant, Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer, and Andrew Torres of the law offices of P. Andrew Torres as legal counsel. Music is provided by Jason Camo of alawstateofmind.com and used with permission. 
Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC, copyright 2018, all rights reserved.